Right, welcome to the next chapter for Statistics, Math 120 at ECC. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about the normal distribution. We're going to start in the first section, uh, whoops, talking about what is the normal distribution, what are its properties, what does its graph look like, uh, and talk about area and how we interpret area now. One of the big differences now is we're not just going to have um, random variables that can be single countable values. What happens when we have random variables that can take on a range of variables of values if they're um, instead of being discrete they're countable um, instead of being discrete they can be continuous like measuring height or weight and we can't say well what's the probability that someone weighs exactly this amount but we can say what's the probability that they're in range so things like that uh, we're going to be looking at with the normal distribution. So first of all, we actually are going to start with a discrete random variable. Um, this is one that we've talked about before, uh, the sum of two dice. And um, once we look at the sum here, it can take on values from 2 to 12. And I have a uh, probability histogram here where the y values are the probabilities and the x values um, are the sum, the possible sums. So for example, say we want to look at um, the probability that x is less than or equal to 4. If we look at uh, the histogram, that would be those first three rectangles there. And we can add their probabilities up 136, 236, and 336. We could also think of it as an area of the rectangle. Now it might not seem valuable, like why go to this trouble of thinking of it as area, but we'll see later that area and probability have a very strong connection. So if we look at the area of those three rectangles, their width is just one unit. So if we multiply width times height, width times height, width times height, we get the same thing. It's that same probability. So we're just hinting at this connection between area and probability, that the area in this histogram is actually the same as the probability of that particular those particular events. So let's talk about what happens if the distribution isn't discrete? So for example, suppose we have a random number generator and it's going to pick a random number between 0 and 1. So it can be any number between 0 and 1. This means up to 500 digits or a million digits. Any number between million and between 0 and 1, you know, point, it's got to be 0 point something, could be 1, could be 0, anywhere in the middle. The question is, what is the probability that it's exactly 0.5? Now before you answer that, think about that question. This number x can be anything between 0 and 1, any of those real numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.14, 0 0.12973265, all right? So we want to know what is the probability that it is exactly, it lands right on 0 0.5. The reality is that a probability is 0. It can't take on, we the likelihood there are infinitely many possibilities there we want to know what's the likelihood that it is this one single possibility that it's basically impossible because there's infinitely many possibilities now the question that we can answer what's the probability that it's in a range like what if we if we're picking a number between 0 and 1 what's the probability that the random number would be between 0.2 and 0.4 well, that's an easier question to answer because then we're looking at a range of values. So we're looking at what is the probability that's between 0.2 and 0.4. And so we could say, well, that's that's 20% of the whole width, so the probability is 20% or 0.2. That's the type of question we're going to answer. Now, not everything has a probability where they're all equally likely, like this one is. But that's the type of question we're going to answer. And in order to answer that, we're going to need something called a probability density function. There's a lot of vocabulary here. This is like the worst way to use PowerPoint, make videos, but it's an equation used to compute probabilities. Now, the issue is, is it doesn't tell you the probability of a particular value, because like we said, that probability here is going to be zero. What it can do is tell you how dense the probability is near there. So if the equation has a higher value, then, then x values near there are likelier. So ranges near there are likely. If the probability function is low, then the probability in that area is low. Um, so the couple statements here, the total area has to equal 1. 
It's a probability density function. We know the total probability has to be 1, so the total area has to be 1. Um, and then the height has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because we're talking about, it's not the probability of those values, but how dense is the probability there. Um, and so you can't say, well, it has negative density. That doesn't make sense. So it could have 0. So, and it could be 0 for a while, so all those values are impossible. But then it has to be positive values. All right, so one way to think of this is that um, the, the random number generator is called a uniform probability density function, where the probability density is uniform. Now, in this case, I know it has to be 1 because I know this full area has to equal 1. And so it's 1 times 1. The full area is 1. Now, if I'm looking at what is the probability that a random number um, is between 0.2 and 0.4, well, that's just the area underneath that curve between 0.2 and 0.4. So this is an example of a pretty simple probability density function. Most of ours are going to be more complex, but that's an example. So there's a couple ways to interpret then that area. Um, the first way is to say, well, that's the, the percent of the population or the proportion of the population with that particular characteristic. So whatever range it is you're looking at, that's the percent of the, the, the observations that are there. It's like random numbers. Well, if the, the area is 0.2, that means 20% of the random numbers are in there. The second way is, well, if I randomly select an individual, what's the probability that they'll be in there? So that's the other question is, well, if I, if I randomly pick a number between, point two, between 0 and 1, what is the probability that it's between 0.2 and 0.4? So it's what is, it, it, two different interpretations are what proportion of the population are in there, and or what is the probability that a randomly selected individual is there. So if we look at some examples, this is one we are not going to be able to get to this particular distribution. Uh, if you ever take a higher level stats class, this is one you will probably look at. It's called the exponential distribution. It's used to model wait times. Uh, if you've ever studied college algebra if recently, uh, you might remember exponential functions. And you can look at this and, and recognize an exponential function here. Um, it's often used to model the, the, the wait times between events, like how long is it between car accidents at an intersection? Or how long is it until some computer component or a light bulb burns out? Um, so it's time until something happens. So it can be anywhere from zero. Well, it's not going to be zero, right? It's, it's as soon as it is made, then some time has elapsed. So, but from zero to infinity, ostensibly a light bulb could last forever. Now, it's a model, right? It's not 100% accurate, um, but it's often used. So if we look at this particular graph here and we shade that area from 5 on, one way to interpret that is it's the proportion of light bulbs that last more than 5 years. Or you could also say what is the prob it's the probability that any randomly selected light bulb will last more than 5 years. So two different interpretations. It's proportion of individuals or probability. A uh, different example, this particular function, uh, I can't remember the name of this one. Uh, it's one I'm not as familiar with, but I was looking for other examples. Uh, so this is an interesting one. It's talking about um, trying to model risk and assess risk. So here we have a graph uh, of a probability density function where we have uh, losses. And so whatever this particular case is, you know, this is some credit loss or who knows what the situation is. but. We might have, okay, here's the average loss, and below that, those are losses that we kind of expect. And then beyond that are unexpected losses. So you can see the distribution is pretty heavy here. These are most of the losses we expect. But it is possible to have these catastrophic losses over on the right. So again, if I shade some particular area here and say this is a loss of X dollars, well, then there are two ways to interpret that shaded area. It's either the proportion of losses that are more than that dollar amount, or it's the probability that any one randomly selected loss will be more than that dollar amount. So again, area, two interpretations, either proportion or uh, probability. All right, next let's talk about, we're going to talk about the, the normal distribution and get into that particular distribution. So here I have some data. This is data we collected at uh, ECC. Uh, in 2014, we, we gave a test, 15 quest, or 15 point test to all the students that took uh, Math 102, which is general education statistics. 
And these are the results. And first question here is how would you characterize the distribution shape? So if you take a look at that, take a look at that shape there, you can see um, looks pretty left skewed, right? It has those outliers over there on the left. Those students either didn't take it seriously or you know really didn't understand. But most students, you know, between nine and thirteen points on there, so it's got some little weird jumps in it, but it's basically left skewed. So what if we look at a random sample of 30 students? So we've got 30 students. We know the mean of all of the scores is 10.6 with, with a standard deviation of 3.1. If we did a random sample of 30 students, what mean you would expect for that sample of 30 students? If you think about that, if it's a good random sample, it should probably have a mean close to the real population mean. Now, it might be a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, but it might be exact. Um, it's probably not going to be, you're not going to have a mean of zero. That's not going to be possible because you have 29 other observations in there. So if this one student zero ends up in your sample, well, you've got a bunch of other 29 other ones from over here. So you're not going to have that that same spread because you've got 30 people in your sample now so your mean that sample mean is most likely going to be 10.6 or right around there somewhere maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less now think about this what if you did this 100 times so 100 random samples of size 30 how would you expect the mean of those 100 sample means to be. Interestingly here, not all the sample means are going to be 10.6. They're not. Some are going to be a little lower. That was the 10.6 was the population mean here. So some, you know, if that one, if you get a zero or maybe you get zero and two in your sample, well then your mean's going to be lower than that. It might be a little bit lower, a little bit higher. But if you look at all of the samples of size 30, what's interesting is the mean of all of them is exactly 10.6. But they're not nearly as spread out. Here's an example of, of 100 such samples. This isn't all the possible samples of size 30. You'd have to do 149 C30. So 149, you know, combination of 149, you're choosing 30 of them. That's a really, really astronomically big number. But I, I used a computer program, I think I used Excel, to randomly select this and do 100 of these. Uh, and here is the histogram, and you can see here this distribution shape fairly normal. And it doesn't go very low, 9.4 for the lowest, 11.8 for the highest. Uh, and interesting, there, there's three things I want to mention here. First of all, the shape now is symmetric, even though, go back over here, the shape was clearly skewed left for the original variables. But if I have 30 people in my sample, that's not going to be skewed left anymore. Uh, it's going to be fairly symmetric. The mean is going to be exactly 10.6 um, and the standard deviation now of these means is much smaller. So the main result from this, we can come up with a general statement, is that no matter what the original population looks like, if you look at the sample means, they will be approximately bell-shaped. Uh, the general guideline is if n is at least 30, you can be pretty much guaranteed that the distribution will be bell-shaped. Uh, there's no mathematical proof behind that, but the general guideline is if you have 30 in your sample, you'll have a roughly symmetric distribution. Now, hopefully that 30 rings a bell for you because we've been talking a lot about that uh, 30 when it comes to our projects. We want to have 30 students for our class for our project. Well, that's the reason why. So this particular distribution, this bell-shaped distribution, is really important because we do lots of analysis of the sample mean. The sample mean is something that um, is used, like we're going to analyze it in our project. Kind of one of the big points of the course is how do we compare sample means? How do we know if they're different? Well, we need to know how they're distributed. And so this, this, this distribution, this bell-shaped curve, um, this is one of the primary reasons for it. So let's jump into it. The normal distribution. This is this bell-shaped curve. Its official name is the normal distribution. Um, it's symmetric. 
It has a mean of zero, so we'd have zero in the middle. Uh, it has a standard deviation of one, so one, two, three, and then negative one, negative two, negative three. Uh, it follows the empirical rule, and the total area under this curve is one, and that's the normal distribution. Uh, we're going to emphasize technology, but I do want to talk about how we can find areas in this curve using a table, so you've at least been exposed to it. Um, you can use a table if you want on tests and things, but we're going to be using StatCrunch. Um, it's much more effective to use technology, but I have heard that some transfer institutions after this still make you use the table, uh, which I think is a little alarming, but um, we're going to just show it just so, you, so you've seen it. So here's the table that I mean. Um, there is one in our book. We can get it online. You can get it in D2L. Uh, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So what this table does is it shows the area to the left. So if we look at a particular column and a particular row and look where they overlap, that value there represents the area to the left of negative 2.82. So this table of values here represents area to the left. StatCrunch, though, has all of this under the calculator menu. You can go to normal and you can enter in some of this. We'll do this a little bit later, but you can calculate all of these areas, both um, standards. So this is kind of like binomial. Enter in your information or you can do between uh, and do that as well. So we'll do some more of this in the next section when we actually talk about not just zero and one and this, this standard normal, this Z. Um, which is the number of standard deviations. We've talked about that before, but we'll do more examples when we talk about other random variables and how they're distributed.